This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 60. Hi there, and welcome to a special Christmas Day edition of the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. Today's holiday edition show is a discussion between myself, American Handgunner editor Tom McHale, and our recently retired boss and publisher, Roy Huntington. As we're approaching the end of a really weird year, we decided to take a walk down memory lane and examine our favorite guns and accessories that have graced the pages of Guns and American Handgunner in the past year. But before we get started, I would like to remind you this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast is sponsored by our friends at Kimber. Kimber was founded with the singular purpose of making every firearm the best it can possibly be with a fit and finish that only practiced hands can achieve and appreciate. Whether you carry a Kimber for personal protection, hunting, or competition, know that their promise of quality without compromise is how they measure success. To learn more about Kimber Firearms, visit KimberAmerica.com. Well, this was a fun episode to record because I got to go back and look at all the cool stories from the past year. Sometimes you're so busy getting the work done, you just don't have time to sit back and actually savor the guns you're talking about. Now here's our roundtable thoughts on the best guns of 2020 from Guns and American Handgunner magazines. This is the Christmas Day edition, and okay, let's admit it, we're not recording this on Christmas Day because, frankly, we want to spend time with our families, but it's just a a couple of days before Christmas, and I thought I'd get the old gang back together, and we've got Tom McHale, the actual editor of American Handgunner, and Roy Huntington, our former boss who just retired this year, and we thought we would talk about all the cool stuff in our two great magazines over the past year. It's uh, looking back over the past issues, and I had to go back because I, you know, I got the memory of a crack baby. I can't remember what I did last month, but uh, <laughs> there's there's That's a lot a of vivid cool... picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. No, there's a lot of cool stuff back there. So. I, I called the guys. I said, let's just do a walk down memory lane and close out 2020 and talk about some of the fun stuff that, that we've covered. So there's no no agenda here, no format. We're just going to kind of talk about stuff that we found fun. And I've got a list here of, of some stuff that it's it was pretty cool. So I, I will cede the floor. Uh, does anybody want to start off and, and talk about maybe the, the highest of the highlight for 2020? Can I, oh. can I encourage the floor to, to Mr. Roy? Sure. Okay, I'll take because, it. Yeah, because we'd have to point out the uh, the very special American handgunner gun for a highlight of. Oh, that's a good right? point. That's a good point. So, Roy, what about the Les Bear American handgunner handgun? You know that it's at the very top of my list, and it's it's I'm proud of it because we worked hard and long to get it done, and it was a product of the reader's imaginations. And so, over the last oh gosh, I don't know, ten years, I've sort of kept some notes uh, when readers say, I wish that uh, uh, I could get a 1911 with this on it. And so then what I did was at the end, uh, I chatted with Les Bear and I said, Les, um, you know, can we make a gun that's sort of built to reader specs? And, you know, Les is funny because he goes, yeah, you bet. We can do whatever we want. And uh, so that's what we did. And so the American Handgunner Special Edition is kind of a commemorative gun is really a commemorative gun that the readers put together that Les Bear builds. And so uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, go to AmericanHandgunner.com, go to Les Bear's website if you'd like. They're available. You can buy them. And uh, it's a two-tone gun, so it's kind of retro, hard chrome frame, blue slide, five-inch gun. Uh, my test gun, which we put in uh, American Handgunner magazine, Tom, you have to help me with what issue that was because I can't recall. July, Off August, my head. 2020. So there we go. July, August. Uh, my gun shot basically less than an inch at 25 yards, which is typical of Les's guns. And so uh, it comes in a typical Les Bear cardboard box, but it has a certificate that certifies it's American Handgunner, a special edition gun. And it's signed by Les and signed by me. Not that that matters at all, but it's better than a poke in the eye. And uh, I have to say, it's just really fun. All right, next. Next. Well, let's throw it to Tom then. 
Wow, two handguns in a row. Nice. You've only got six issues a year, where I got twelve. So you can well, go ahead. Oh, and... So you're gonna you're gonna finish the entire second half of the show. Oh, by absolutely, I, absolutely. Okay. You can just you know go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> no. Okay, I'm gonna do something. Assuming I'm gonna have another go at this in this show, I'm gonna do something a little different here, and I am gonna call out a highlight favorite story. Oh, okay. That, that I have qualifies. one favorite story, if you made me pick, from 2020, and it is also in the July-August issue. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My bad. My bad. It is the November-December issue of Handgunner, uh, and it is called My Father's Colt, mm. and it is a tearjerker. Well, I don't know, tearjerker of a story in some ways, but it, but in happy ways, not not tragedy. Yeah. Um about um, uh, a man's father who carried a cult through three wars, same same 1911. A guy named uh, Bruce Cherry wrote it, and it is absolutely fantastic. We got more we got more reader mail on that story than just about anything. So I don't want to spoil too much, but um, that's a must do. It's on our website, AmericanHandgunner.com. Just type in the search bar "My Father's Cult" and you can enjoy it for yourself. It's kind of a it's not a holiday theme, but it's a, a nice little story to read through the holidays. Can we tell the backstory on that? Which is, he, he basically just set a story. And he's, a, as I recall, he's a newspaper reporter, so he could write. And he just sent that story to share. And then when we saw it, we just went, holy cow, this is great. And that's what caused it to end up in the magazine. Yeah, I mean, I... I Okay, we'll drop a couple of hints about the story, but uh, but the the Three Wars saga started in World War II when uh, Bruce's dad uh, was shot down over France, you know, in his bomber, and you know he he uh, had with him what he always had with him on his side, his Colt, you know, strapped on when he hit the dirt in uh, war torn France behind enemy lines. So it's uh, just some some phenomenal storytelling in there. Very cool. And I was going to stick with the gun theme, but if you're going to talk favorite stories, uh, I've got to go in guns for the September issue. Will Dabbs wrote a really cool story about a Remington New Model Army that got dug up near his house in uh, Mississippi, and it came up in a backhoe bucket with some other stuff and long story I, i'm going to go ahead and, and probably ruin the story for you you need to read it but <laughs> he did some research and he figured out in all likelihood what union officer that pistol belonged to because there was a skirmish near his home and there was only one casualty and it was a union officer who would have been carrying a remington new model army so it's very likely that that gun probably belonged to that that officer who who perished on the battlefield so you know you talk about uh, just i'm a history buff i'm a civil war buff uh imagine just be standing there and and you know he said that kind of stuff happens pretty regularly in areas where there was a lot of civil war activity but you know the backhoe comes up and oh there's something there and it's this uh the frame to this new model army and it had the the uh, brass frame and it didn't look too bad the uh, steel parts were obviously in pretty bad shape but uh uh, you could definitely tell what it was. And I just, as a history buff, I thought that was so cool. And the fact that he connected it to, in all likelihood, this one fellow who who perished away from home in the Civil War. Wow. I, I, yeah, know, I, re I remember that funny. story. I read that story. It was just phenomenal. Yeah. And Will's such a, a colorful writer that he brings those things in and they, they come to life. He found, he, he wrote this up, and I think it was in Guns Magazine, but he found a Civil War era live cannonball uh, <laughs> as part of part of that battle. And yeah. then he, he wrote a really funny story about he and his dad going out in the woods and bringing a drill press and a generator, <laughs> and and they actually drilled this uh, from a distance, and uh, and it was live, and it had black powder in it. And yeah. he, so he, the difference, though, was really funny. He said a fishing game warden came by and said, what y'all up to here? And he said, well, my dad and I, we're, we got this Civil War cannonball, and it's got black powder in it. We're drilling it, and we're doing it at a safe distance. And he said in those days, the game warden just looked at him and said, oh, okay, and then walked off. Right? <laughs> you know, yes. like, can you imagine that happening today? But the as long as you're not that, poaching, right? <laughs> I know. As long as you're not poaching, I don't care what you're doing. The cool thing about that, though, is that he, at one time, he gave me, I have a little container that's got a little just a couple grams of Civil War era black powder 
from that cannonball, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. so, wow, so thank nice. you, Will. So, right. That's fantastic. We'll, we'll reverse this since I've got twice as many stories to choose from. I got to say my next favorite, and this goes into the gun category too, was in the August issue. Will wrote a, and reviewed our cover gun, which was the Tipman Armory Gatling gun. Now, it's mm. a Gatling gun. It's nine millimeter. It's uh, very closely based to the original Gatling uh, blueprint. And, you know, I got to say, I, I, I told Will something, and, and I think he appreciated it, that I said, you know, normally the editor takes uh, editor's priority on, on things that you want to shoot. And I just didn't have time at that point. But he got to shoot a freaking Gatling gun. And I didn't. And if you don't call that sacrifice above and beyond the call of duty, um, I don't know what is. So one of these days, I've got to drive up to Tipman Armory, which is only a couple hours from my house, and I got to shoot me that bad boy because it just looks oh, like yeah. about the most fun you could have. I, I, um, <laughs> I got to I, shoot a, a real Gatling gun one time, a forty-five seventy one. Yeah. So that was, yeah, it's too addictive, though. You have to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you got the checkbook, you know. I had to exert um, privilege also in the November, December issue, and uh, I don't feel the least bit guilty about it. And it was for the the cover gun in that issue, which is a Kimber Rapid Black Ice 1911. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I saw saw a picture of this thing early, and um, it is, I would describe it as a modernistic, cosmetic design with uh, a gun just built for speed they kind of designed it as a a competition oriented gun you know every little tweak to increase lock time and all that jazz and uh, it is just absolutely gorgeous as far as new guns go and that that might have been my favorite gun that i had my hands on in in 2020 this one was a 10 millimeter which is uh, just awesome and i I have to say I'm, i'm glad to see 10 millimeter making a an apparent resurgence. There are lots of them coming out this this past year. So, yep. You know, a lot of people are are realizing that that I mean, basically, if you have a ten millimeter, you've got a, a low end forty one magnum. <laughs> and so, <laughs> well, geez, what's wrong with that in a five inch nineteen eleven? Although I like it even more in those six inch guns. You know, so that yeah, so that's cool. Hey, is it my turn to to do this? Sure. I think. It was a banner year, I think, for guns for me. Uh, Ruger LCP2 was a lot of fun uh, in 22. and But I think the one that really, really, really sticks in my memory is the course series that we cover in Handgunner and and the Mongoose especially. The, the fancy one that's the cover gun is absolutely beautiful and it's like a, you know heritage i think that's the name of the heritage and, and it is exciting and it's amazing and it's eight thousand or nine thousand dollars but the gun that really caught my eye was the two and three quarter inch barreled sort of l framey you know they call it the mongoose and i don't you know i'm not sure about that name i don't know what you guys think but I mean, yeah, I know a mongoose is a tough guy. He's a bit like a, a miniature honey badger, kind of. So I'm I'm assuming that's what that's all about. I don't know for sure. But holy cow, I really wanted to hate that gun. And then once I got it and I shot it and I shot it again and we made that video and I just fell in love. And I haven't fallen in love with a gun, I don't know, since, since I was 10 yesterday. years old. I got my first 22. <laughs> since yesterday, damn it. You know, <laughs> I was going to say that's an occupational hazard. I, I wasn't buying I that. that before the words even got out of your mouth. I was not buying that statement. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, you know, we all we go, oh, that's a pretty gun. or Oh, that's really cute. Or, oh, I like that. Or, you know, and that's true. And that's it. But I mean, actually to have one that it, it lives on my desk permanently because I ended up having to buy it, of course. And once and also I got over the fact that it, initially, I it said three thousand six hundred dollars. I went, <clears throat> and then I stopped and I thought, wait a minute. I mean, how many custom nineteen elevens have all three of us handled that were four and five and six thousand dollars? And nobody's hair catches on fire. And so, why should your hair catch on fire for for what is in actuality absolutely positively a custom revolver uh, that costs? You know, three thousand five hundred, three thousand six hundred dollars, which really in today's market is a real entry level custom gun. 
you know, if you look at Wilson or Nighthawk Custom or, you know, those kind of places, you know, $3,500 kind of opens the door, you know, <laughs> for one of their guns. Yep. So uh, anyway, core that was my <laughs> all-time favorite. Very cool. And and you had to buy it. That's what I love. You had to buy it. They made had, me. They made me. They, <laughs> yeah, they called me up. Mark Stone called me up and he said, you have to buy this. And so when they say that, you just go, okay, I'm sorry, I will. You, you know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. I liked, and it was on my list, was the uh, December cover gun, which was the Dan Wesson Vigil CCO. And you did that, Roy. And, you know, it's funny. It's hard for me to say what I like about that gun. It's just, it's good looking and, and it, it checks all the boxes. Did you have uh, any further insight on that one? Or was that just... Uh, uh, an, one of many really good guns. Well, it is that category of gun that shorter, you know, it's more modest. I'm going to call it a commandery kind of a right. gun, you know, uh, in nine millimeter in a 1911 platform. It, it's my favorite 1911 platform, and especially with a lightweight frame. It's like, hello, like you said, it checks all the boxes. And it's been proven time and time again now in the real world that nine millimeter and 45, there's really no difference, you know, in stopping power and all that kind of stuff. So I love the light recoil. I love the easier to run slide and the Dan lessons are just so beautifully made, yeah. you know? So I think you have good taste, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never been accused of that. So that's a good thing to say. That's a first. <laughs> oh. Well, when it comes to that gun, you have good taste. <laughs> yeah, not life in general. Um, oh, other okay. than your choice of wife, that shows oh. you have some good yeah. taste too. So even a blind squirrel oh, yeah. finds a nut. Well, once. for football fans, my buddies and I always say we outkick the coverage, meaning <laughs> we we did far better than what we should have. So uh, uh, I don't know how that happened, but uh, we I would say we're all very lucky in that category. And that's not just kissing up right before Christmas. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Whose turn is it? I think it's Tom's. I, yeah, I'll, I'll throw out one out there. And um, I'm going to make a deliberate statement here that uh, we are not always all bougie, you know, talking only about multi-thousand wow. dollar guns. Uh, uh, we had some winners this year that I think are in the very approachable and even budget categories right so talking about polymer service pistols uh, one that stands out in my memory is the ruger 57 mm -hmm. and uh, actually it was doc dabs did a story on that and he titled it a love story <laughs> <laughs> wow. now now in fairness he he really liked it he really really liked that pistol um he actually carries it uh, you know on a really? regular basis so not exactly a compact gun but it does pack a 20 plus one capacity of those zippy little 5.7 cartridges <laughs> you have to remember you may not know this but one time i had tasked will to carry a desert eagle around every day for a while <laughs> so so he seems to have the genetic makeup to be able to carry those big guns but i, I know what you mean when ruger first introduced that gun i just at first i kind of went huh? <laughs> you know but after my experiences with the fn version of it which just between us, yeah. I mean, it, I don't know. I it wasn't that of exciting of a thing. I think you know. I wanted more out of it, and then uh, and then Ruger announced this, and in typical Ruger fashion, you know, they just like nailed it. And uh, so kudos to Will for seeing that. Yeah, he wears scrubs too, and he conceals these things. The five seven and Desert Eagles. We he finally he finally gave up his secret though in the. Um, the concealed carry and home defense annual edition that just went out and he he does a disconnected belt meaning no loops or anything on the on the scrubs and he just wears this giant belt around his waist <laughs> with whatever holster and gun combination he wants and he puts on his scrubs so it's like kind of a an independent uh, carry system he uses and apparently it works oh i always wondered how he did that because you know how yeah. on earth do you keep I, you know i always wondered that and i i never thought to ask him i'll be darned that's probably you could probably do that almost like a belly band kind of idea, you know, yeah. extend that into into other things. What an interesting idea. 
you know, Will Will always struck me as one of those guys that you see uh, videos periodically where they start taking all the guns off and they've got like, you know, a, a 50 BMG and all this <laughs> other stuff concealed under, you know, like a T-shirt and running shorts. I just see Will doing something like that. Well, Roy, you can you steal remember? that that method when you go out at night in your jammies to hunt armored dillers. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's another story. We uh, had another running gun battle the other day, but oh, I'll no. share the story with you guys later. Wow. You know, uh, 150 years ago, um, when I worked at Bianchi, we still had copies of John Bianchi's book, Blue Steel and Gun Leather. Mm -hmm. And in the the, the lead of it, uh, if there was a picture of him in a, in a white jack tux jacket and, you know, in black pants, looking like 007. He liked to do that. He was like to take those kind of pictures. But then when he opened the, his coat up, I think I, I forget what the number was, but he was concealing like 67 guns <laughs> you know, all over his body. You have multiple ankle holsters and the holsters all the way around his belt and multiple shoulder holsters and inside the pockets and all that. But I have to say, when the coat was buttoned and he was holding perfectly still in the days before Photoshop, uh, it didn't look like it. It was very funny. Wow. Um, I draw the line at about three guns. And beyond that, then I start getting embarrassed. <laughs> if it's my turn, your turn, I, I've, I've got to say the September, or I'm sorry, the February cover gun is a favorite because it's mine. It's very common in law enforcement. If your department changes guns, a lot of times they'll offer you the uh, opportunity to buy your gun back. And a lot of guys do that. So I did. We, we were carrying Glock 22s at that point, uh, the 40. And I forget why we changed. And I'm sure the reason wasn't really good, but we did anyway. So I've had that Glock 22 and not really used it. And I had an opportunity with TMT Tactical to send it in and get the full meal deal. And oh, my goodness. Uh, they, they, we call the gun, the thin blue line. It's got a thin blue line, uh, Cerakote across the top. They did all kinds of really neat stuff. They've got some, uh, they, I think they call it bone saw serrations on the front of the slide. Uh, they, they engraved an American flag on the top. They put an optic cut out, uh, stippled it, reduced the grip a little bit and did, you know, the, the black art voodoo to the, the trigger assembly. And it's just a, an awfully cool gun. And it's one of those, I don't want it to be a safe queen, but it, it looks so good. I'm half afraid to take it out and really shoot around with it. So, and the sad thing is of shoot all, it, the, all the calibers, it, shoot it. yeah, I was yeah. just at a gun show a couple of days ago and the, about the only caliber you can really get a lot of is 40. It's still just not that popular. I mean, it's, it's a little short too, but of all the quote unquote tactical calibers, I mean, 40 is pretty easy to find. And I'm thinking, you know, I just, I just need to get it out and shoot it. And, but it looks, it looks so nice. So it's an involuntary safe queen, I'll call it. But uh, a big shout out to the folks at TMT Tactical. Uh, they really did right by me. And I've, I'm going to take some other perfection and send it to them because, man, like those bone saw uh, cocking serrations and some of the other stuff they did was really uh, take the pretty side out of it uh, from a, a carry gun or comp gun standpoint. Pretty good stuff. So, and you know, I want to give them another shout out there because they're also really, really, really nice people. And yeah. they do a lot of special edition guns that get used for, you know, like raffle guns to benefit, you know, wounded warrior type organizations and that kind of stuff. Uh, the owner of the company there is just a real, just uh, like a big heart. And, uh, and they do that. And of course they do really innovative, interesting work. So I was glad to see when you were able to get that organizing and, and glad to see them on the covers. Yep. Well done. All right. My turn. I have <laughs> two. 22s on my favorite guns that I've played with in 2020. Uh, the first one is Ruger LCP 222. Uh, boy, you know, we did a little fun video on it. And I have to say, that's another one that kind of lives on my desk. And I have a 80 yard gong here. And so periodically I step outside on the patio here and it just goes bang, tink, bang, tink, bang, tink. <laughs> you know, huh. it's, it shoots way out of proportion to its size or demeanor or caliber or anything else. And, and I think uh, some time ago when I think we did a gun cranks or a podcast or something on is a 22, you know, enough for self-defense, but this gun really made me rethink that because it's, it's convenient. It's reliable. You know, it just, 
it's accurate. And I thought, good Lord, you know, what is there not to like here? Especially if you're sort of infirm, you have kind of weak hands because, because it's got that real light rack, you know, system on it. And Ruger LCP2 in 22. And then you can match it with one in 380 and you have a kind of his and hers thing. Of course, hers may be the 380 and his may be the 22, lest we get uh, angry <laughs> letters from women. So, <laughs> so shall I leap to the other 22? I will. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> you just jump right in there. Bolt. It's fine. I did. I got a turn bolt. Uh, it's the Browning BL-22, so it's that lever-action Browning that's made by Morocco. So I would call it the world's nicest lever-action 22, period, to begin with. And then, of course, it gets turnbullized, and so you end up with this. It's, I mean, I think I call it an instant family heirloom. And they're not a huge amount of money, and they're still doing them. And so what they do is they take a modern production BL-22, or if you have one, you could send them yours if it's clean. And then they case harden it and, you know, blew it and do all their fancy Turnbull stuff. And now they're going to start doing the stocks, I believe they told me. So they're going to refinish the stocks, too, to get rid of that kind of browning, you know, spray polyurethane shiny thing they do. And uh, But for around 800 bucks or so, you can get truly an instant family heirloom. And I'm, they just, they're cap drivers, they're a pleasure to shoot, and they're beautiful, you know, and they're well-made. And my gosh, what a rifle to give to a, a son or daughter, you know, I mean, because they'll have it the rest of their lives. So, so there you go. Uh, Browning BL-22, especially the one that Turnbull does. Go to Turnbull's web website, you can see them on there. And they are pretty Cool. Okay. I see the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm cheating, but only a little bit. So the, the one I would call out it actually is in the January, February, 2021 issue, which is what's printed on the cover, but everybody got their hands on it in 2020. And I had my hands on it in 2020. So it's a little bit of fudging, but I think we're legit. So uh, this one was actually the Wilson combat WCP 320. And I liked the idea so much, I bought the frame. <laughs> so let me explain what I'm talking about there. Um, we had the entire uh, Wilson gun in for, for that cover gun for January, February. And um, basically, they take the guts of a fire control system of a 6-hour P320, the modular system that drops into whatever frame you like, and they combine it with special parts. They build their own frame, a Wilson Combat compatible, or version that's compatible with the 320 platform. They take raw slide stock and um, uh, barrels from Sig Sauer and they machine them themselves using their own super cool uh, design. And, and what you get basically is a Wilson combat pistol uh, with all its niftiness and a Sig Sauer fire control system. So it's, a, it's kind of a neat idea. And I, I love to see the, the coopetition, you know? Uh, a lot of a lot of high end gun makers are, are always super proud, and anything made by anybody else is junk, and they would never touch it with a ten foot pole because they're the best, and and all that. And the Wilson folks take a different approach. They build their own, and they build some super sweet stuff. But uh, they'll also recognize quality components in the market and say, "Hey, we can work with that," and uh, you know, jazz it up a little bit and make it fine. So uh, that was a neat gun. I actually liked it so much that I've been buying Wilson frames for my other P three twenties. I find them uh, very, very 1911 like in angle and feel and uh, pointability and those kind of things. So, so that was a highlight for me. Very cool. Well, I, I've got a weird one. This is a discussion question. And we've talked about some incredibly high end firearms here. Let me go completely the other way. And you guys probably know what I'm talking about the Altor pistol. It's one of those, I, I wouldn't argue with you about the uh, viability of the concept or whether it was really useful or et cetera, et cetera, but what a unique thing. I mean, that's just, it's just oddball enough for some reason it appeals to me. <laughs> well, listen to what you just said. <laughs> oddball enough that it appeals to yeah. me. <laughs> Well, you know, there, a little backstory on that is interesting because I agree with you, Brent. It's like odd and it's compelling, but I don't know why. But <laughs> yeah. the guy who invented it 
has a long history of what he does is he looks at the market, a, the whole market, the world you know, market, and he identifies product categories with a whole. It's like, oh, nobody's making something that does fill in the blank. And I mean, it could be, it doesn't matter what it is, a porta potty, you know, it doesn't <laughs> matter. He's a real entrepreneur. And so when he sees that, so consequently, he's got a slew of, of patents and a slew of very successful products in a wide range of different categories. And so what he did with this one was just that, was he said, you know what? There is not a basic, you know, easily manufactured, but high quality, affordable, you know, single shot pistol made for kind of the masses. And then, so then he went and used his engineering uh, juju and that he they designed that, and that's how that's how that all came to to you know to be. It was sort of a he made it to meet a need that he felt was in the market, rather than what we see so often in our industry, which is an inspired you know designer designs something that he just has to make because he has it inside of him, <laughs> and then tries to find a market for it. This guy found the market and then built this product to fit in the market, and I I think he's successful. Yeah, it's about as no frills as it gets, but that's kind of the uh, the beauty of it, I guess. I think you know what I asked him. It was I said, if I make a, a bandolier, like out of canvas or something, I said, can I borrow like a dozen of these so I can stick them in the <laughs> bandolier? So you because remember like a pirate or something, oh, yeah. you know, where you'd have like six or eight, you know, single shot flintlock pistols. Or all the way back in the olden, olden, olden days with the arquebus rifle shooters, they had those bandoliers of all their charges across their. Yeah. I just thought, how cool would that be to have? <laughs> anyway, to his credit, he said, "You build it, I'll send you a dozen of these guns to stick in it and take some pictures." So I gotta oh. get, I have to get one built because that's just <laughs> that's too darn fun. Captain Jack yes. Sparrow Huntington. He's gonna there he's you gonna go. board someone else's yeah. tractor yeah. out there in Missouri. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I could have a tractor supply wearing that, and people would come up and want to know if I got it. I need me one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Whose turn is it? Oh, I've got, I've, I've got all kinds, but looking one. at our time here, uh, oh. I, I was just going to say, uh, let's. I, I would like to spin it to you. Can everybody pick, like, one firearm accessory, whether it be a holster or a gym crack or a jaw, or I think those are how they say that. Just anything that kind of stands <laughs> out as, as some fun that uh, that you like this year? Yes. Tom. There's a lot, but I'm going to go with the Mantis X10 oh. system. Aha! You stole my Shouldn't thunder. Shouldn't let me go first. I know. But So here's the thing. Mantis came out with this gear before 2020, but they, I believe the X10, the latest iteration, I think was a 2020 launch. And what made it change my world is the new capabilities in this thing. Basically, it's a, it's a tiny micro computer magic box that either sticks on the bottom of a handgun magazine or on a rail of a pistol. Um, And it, it measures everything. And what, what is, uh, paradigm changing about it is that it can basically allow you to practice and time draws at home so put one on your magazine you draw and fire dry fire you know in your house and it will tell you how long it took to clear leather how long it took to rotate you know the the barrel horizontal how long it took to raise the muzzle and sights to target how long it took to break the shot and in addition to all that what exactly happened with respect to movement? What path did that muzzle and front sight follow uh, before, during, and after the shot breaks? I mean, it is it is just amazing what this thing does. Uh, if you want to improve your skills, get one. And the the scenario I just described for draws applies to other other things as well. It has a recoil management mode now that. Uh, lets you experiment with your grip and different types of hold, and it'll show you exactly what's happening during recoil and how long it takes to get your uh, your sights back on target. It is just, it is a miracle of technology. So that's my pick for 2020. And you completely stole my thunder and said exactly everything I was going to say, because it, it is, it's a magic freaking box. I didn't know you were going to talk about it, but I know you have one too. So oh yeah, absolutely. Shouldn't let me go first. <laughs> I'm trying to learn. be polite, because I am polite. <laughs> that's me, right? Right. Brent, I'll go next and then I'll give you time to think. Okay. <laughs> so you can come in with another one. So 
I recently read an article that uh, Will Dabbs did in, I think it was Guns, and it was on a hearing aid-looking device thing that you put in each ear. It's made by a company called Tetra, T-E-T-R-A, uh, tetrahearing.com. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I've, I've always liked this sort of hearing w- protection that where you can hear around you, but then it cuts off when you shoot. But the challenge is, is, uh, is you, they're hard to use sometimes for normal conversation and gunfire. There's, you know, they're awkward. And a lot of these in the ear ones I found to be a little bit uncomfortable. So I called them and I talked to them. And it ends up the guy who developed these is actually a hearing aid doctor. And he had a practice for like 25 years. And so what these are are actually really sophisticated hearing aids. And you have to take a hearing aid test and they tune these specifically for you and then their tagline is hear the hunt and so the point is is that while you're out there they actually will tune them so you can hear ducks or they'll (laughs) tune them so you can hear the bugle of an elk and what i am amazed by these things they are miracles they really do work and you it stops gunfire but other than that, rather than just amplifying all ambient sound, it works like hearing aids do, which I wear hearing aids. And so it amplifies the frequencies that you need amplified. And so it is truly a, a, a real significant change in my, my shooting experience because you wear these, you hear conversation, you can hear the creak of, you know, the something, the crack of the branch breaking when you're hunting. You literally do hear the hunt, yet it cuts off at the sound of the shot. And if you want to, you could still put muffs over it if you're shooting, you know, inside the range or something like that. Anyway, Tetra, hear the hunt, tetrahearing.com. It, this is like your, your uh, little shooting practice machine. This really is new technology and, and ramps the game up, and I can't recommend them enough. Very cool. Yeah. Well, in the interest of time, I'm looking at my sheet here, and I've, I've, I've got 15 more guns, and I'm sure you guys do too. So let's go round robin and uh, – the top three to five honorable mentions without getting into the uh, the gory details of why they are so cool. But yeah, just uh, round it up with the, the, the next several on your list. So I'll throw it over to Mr. McHale. Okay, two quick mentions. Uh, Springfield Armory Hellcat. If we're talking about a gun that made a difference in 2020, it's that one. And another one I'd call out just because it's darn cool is the Walther Q4. Basically an all- steel real metal uh version of that series neat stuff well roy my turn your turn okay all right uh i hate to be a copycat but the springfield armory uh, ronin series of 1911 pistols uh nine millimeter and 45 it's a bit like the dan wesson kind of you know in the sense that they're lightweight uh beautifully made nine millimeter or 45 and they're 899 at msrp and it's a, it's just they are a lot of gun for what you get. I'm, I'm just very impressed by them. And the other one is just sheer delight. Uh, Cimarron sent me a number three American a single action. You know, it was, it was the competition for the Colt 1873 in its time. And unlike the old days of Italian guns, you know, the, the, the uh, copies, these are just absolutely impeccably beautifully made and Smith and Wesson would be proud to put their name on it. So those are two of my additional favorite guns. Excellent. Well, I would say, uh, looking down the rock river arms 22, and I forget the the model, Mike Cumston did a uh, review on it. I got to shoot it, uh, uh, right before that. And it's just a uh, typical rock river arms, uh, great quality in a 22 that it does a 22 long rifle that doesn't feel cheap it feels like a really high quality gun so uh, i was i was very impressed with that our may cover gun was the henry side load 4570 just a beautiful gun fun to shoot and that's been one of the things against the henry levers is they didn't have until now a side loader so it was hard to top off so since they've got the tubular magazine so now you can uh, you can load it all at once or you can shove one in as you shoot one and that makes it a lot more practical uh, especially if you're carrying it against say something that bites like a grizzly bear and then okay tom we were going to confine it to 2020 but our february issue just came out and uh john taffin did a campfire tales about the ruger 
Bearcat as done by Tyler Gunworks. And I just talked to him last week on the Guns Magazine podcast. He did a, a pair of guns for me. And I, I am I have not handled the Tyler slash Ruger Bearcat, but it looks really fun, really cool. And John buys them for all his grandkids. So I'm going to have to try that out. That, that got on my list of stuff I need to get. But I will f- finish up with... I'm going to nominate one gunmaker for probably uh, the Brent Wheat Gunmaker of the Year category, and I'm going to make it our friends at Springfield Armory. Uh, those guys have come out with a whole bunch of stuff this year. It's all been well thought out, top flight stuff at a good price point that people can afford. And I think uh, not to uh, diminish any of our other great friends and uh, clients, uh, gun makers, but, but man, the guys at Springfield, they are just hitting on all cylinders right now. So I'd have to say, in my opinion, they're at the top of the game right now. I, I don't know how they're doing I, it. Most yeah. most manufacturers are struggling to make enough of what they already sell, yet all year they keep announcing new stuff and getting it into the channel somehow. So yep. pretty impressive. You know, I, you know, and it's not like they're a Ruger. You know, they're, they're not this huge corporate monster. Yeah. You know, it's basically a family-owned company. <laughs> and and they're out there duking it out with the big guys, kind of. So I agree with you. Uh, my hat's off to them. And I like them because they're also consistent. If you buy if you bought an XD three years ago and you bought one today, it's it's very predictable what you're going to get. It's not like up and down and up and down. You know? yep. <laughs> so cool. I think it's been a banner year, a lot going on. The world's crazy, but I think we're ending it on a positive note. In spite of everything, there was a lot of innovation, a lot of technology, a lot of really cool products. And uh, I just am looking forward to having gunpowder and primers again soon. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that, really. was my, that was going to be my final question is, what are you looking forward to? And I'm not saying necessarily your prognostication of what's going to happen. I'm just saying when you look at 2021, everybody's going, I am so glad 2020 is over. Roy, what do you want to see next year? I would like to see everyone get their senses back, <laughs> you know, and let's, let's just get back to enjoying our life and enjoying our shooting that we like and being friendly to neighbors. And somebody said when a society loses the ability to be civil to one another is that that's the beginning of the end. And we weren't real civil to each other, or at least a lot of the people weren't. And I think for the rest of us, we're really frustrated by that. We want, we want to have good, that good time again. And part of that good time for me, and I think I speak for you guys is, is the enjoy this wonderful industry that we're kind of blessed to be in. I mean, you look at this lineup of guns that we were talking about and accessories. What fun is that? I mean, we could be selling paint at Walmart, you know, and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're not. And so that's what I want. I want some norm normalcy and everyone just calm down. As my <laughs> grandfather used to say. Yep. Well, Tom, your, your parting thoughts. I want two things. I want ammo. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. <there's> that. <laughs> but but what I'd really I what I really am looking forward to seeing is let's uh let's figure out how to embrace and work with these seven million new gun owners that we we collectively acquired, brought into the fold in, in twenty twenty. Um we may or may not have different political views than they do, but apparently we share something in common. So let's uh let's start there and work with that. Exactly. And I guess just for me, uh, I go back to what I've said all along, which is gun and fun are one letter apart. So kind of echoing what Roy said, and let's get back and have some fun and, and just enjoy life again. I think that's what everybody wants, but they seem to be waiting for somebody else to do something to make them happy. And that's not how it works. Just get whatever ammo you have, go out to the range and just go shooting. So, and I hope... Everybody keeps reading American Handgunner and Guns Magazine and their websites. Yep. <laughs> so, so yeah, GunsMagazine.com, AmericanHandgunner.com. And uh, there's a thing you can go on there and you send us some money and we'll actually send you a magazine. <laughs> it's it's the coolest thing. It comes right to your house. Modern technology. <laughs> it is. It is. So. Yeah. And no batteries. You don't no need batteries battery. or anything. So <laughs> yeah. anyway, Merry Christmas, guys. I appreciate it. I don't know if I'll talk to you before the big holiday, but uh, 
hope you guys have a great Christmas and a happy new year. And we'll all get together after this is over and do some shooting. Back at you and everybody out there. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Please tell all your friends, even the liberals. Guns Magazine is number one in the business, and we're using our decades of friendships to bring you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got questions or comments, please drop me a line. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you don't miss out by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast directory and YouTube. Of course, you can always listen and download our episodes at gunsmagazine.com. And we'd all appreciate it if you'd share a favorite episode on your own social media channels. And of course, while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publication, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com. Finally, before we go, I'd like to remind you to also check out our sponsor, Kimber Firearms at KimberAmerica.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. On behalf of the staff here at FMG Publications, I'm sending out Christmas best wishes from our family to yours. I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. <laughs>